And it's a great hope, isn't it? Because there's a lot that goes on in this world. If this is all we have to hope for, Paul said this, if this is all we have to hope for, then we are to be pitied above all people. But we have something much greater to hope for. God has made a promise, and he is a God of promises. That is his nature. That's what he does. He makes promises, and he keeps his promises. He's always faithful to keep his promises, and he's promised that we get to go home with him. He's promised us that this place is not what we were made for, that this is just a short-term assignment, and then we get to go home what, to be where we're truly made. We're looking forward to that. It's good to be back with you. We had a great trip to Texas. It was good to be with kids and grandkids and got about a thousand pictures I could show you today, but I'm going to refrain. I'm going to control myself. But we did a lot of dancing, a lot of singing, and a lot of playing games with the grand girls. And it was a good time to be with family. God has blessed us in so many ways. I just feel like we need to stop and say thanks again. Father, you've given us this morning. You have blessed us with another day. Father, we know this day was not promised to us. We know that life is fragile. So Father, we pray that you would bless us today with the wisdom, with the presence of mind to use the day that you've given us. To use it well, to hear your voice, to know your presence, to, to be aware of your presence, not to miss your presence, but Father, help us to take joy in your presence. Even through the difficult times of life, Father, help us to remember your promises. Father, we do thirst for you. And I pray that where our thirst has been filled by other things, that you would correct us, that you would bring us back to thirst for what is truly pure and holy in your presence and your power. So, Father, be with us this morning. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been looking at the idea that the word Christian is often used in the world today as an adjective to describe a type of music or a type of a bookstore or a type of a movie or a type of something. But the Bible never uses it that way. The Bible always uses the word Christian as a noun. It is something. It's something particular. And we've learned very early on that in a sentence, a noun requires a verb. And so we have been looking through the book of James to find out some of the verbs that God applies to the term Christian. We've looked at the verb do. He says be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. The word love. Love is a verb. It is a noun, but it's also verbs. And God uses this, we need to be people who love. And that is one of the hardest things he gives us to do. But he also tells us we need to submit another hard thing for us to do, but to be an authentic Christian, to be one who really lives up to what we claim, these are things we need to be about. Doing, loving, submitting to God and to each other. I'm going to share another verb with you this morning. We see most verbs are full of action, full of going and doing things. But the verb I'm going to share with you today is a little more sedate. And it's not a verb that we like. Of course, a lot of these verbs we don't like. I, we like the idea of a lot of these verbs. We like the idea of, of people going out and doing things, as long as it doesn't impact my schedule. We like the idea of people loving everybody, as long as I don't have to love that person. You know, we like the idea, but sometimes they're, they're hard to do. Look at James chapter 5. Open your Bibles up. And keep this open, because we're going to spend some time here in chapter 5 of James today. Just a few verses, verses 5, 7 through 11. And the verb he uses here is translated in different ways, but it's the same idea. See if you can pick up on it. James chapter 5, verse 7. 
James writes to us, he says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop? Patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains? You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. There's an idea talked about in this passage several times and he uses different words. He uses the word wait. He uses the word patient. He uses the word persevere. And these are things that Christians do. But you say, that's not doing, that's just sitting back. Well, it is doing something. Sometimes we get so enamored by action that we forget to wait. We are, our world is a victim of the God of now. We are cursed by the God of now. I want it now. You guys can relate to this. There are probably some of the worst financial decisions you've ever made in your lives because of the God of now, right? This deal is not gonna be here tomorrow. You've gotta buy it now to get the deal. Okay, okay, I'll buy it now. And then tomorrow you go, oh, why did I do that? Or you can get rich today <laughs> if you just give me this. And we make financial decisions because we can get something now. You've seen not just money, but sports. We hear we put a new coach on a team and we don't want to hear his five-year plan. We want him to win a game today, right? We want him to be winning this season because if he's not winning this season, he probably won't be around next season, will he? We want, we want it now. Give me some results, okay? Many of the ethic problems we have in sports are related to the pressure that coaches and players feel to produce now. Get this done today. Dare I say anything about politics? God has blessed us to live in a nation where we can vote. However small that voice is, it is a voice that we've been given and we need to be responsible with that gift that God has given us. And I want to encourage you this season, we've got to do a lot of study. We've got some hard choices to make of who to vote for. And I want to encourage you to be responsible with that gift that God has given us to study the parties, to study the, don't just vote because you've been that party for so many years because the parties have all changed. Everything's different. Be responsible with your voting. But understand this. We are a part of the political problems in this country. We encourage our candidates to lie to us because they know that we vote for the people who say they can fix it now. We want somebody to come in and fix it like this instead of the long, slow process of turning the battleship around. We want quick sports car action. We want it to happen now. And we vote for those people and so they tell us things that are not true because they want our vote. You see, we are cursed by this God of now, this God of instant, the God of, I want to have it quickly. We even see the God of now right here at church. Somebody will come in and they'll be here for two Sundays 
expecting the problems of 20 years to fade away in just a couple weeks of trying to draw near to God. And they give up when it doesn't happen that quickly. We see people who say, if, if they would just give us the right program, then we could have instant spirituality and we'd be a powerhouse. If, they just, if somebody would just do the right program or the right event. We even want church service to be fast, don't we? I did a funeral service at a different church here in town and the, the podium was, was clear as plexiglass, so you see right through it. And on the floor underneath the podium where you, the speaker all, saw it all the time was this clock. It was about this big around. <laughs> big hands. No excuse. You're looking at your notes and you see the clock. We were dominated by the clock and by the time and get this done and be punctual and be on time and get do our duty and get out because I've got things to do and places to go. The preacher noticed a man once getting up to leave and he stopped him. He said, where are you going? The man turned around and said, to get a haircut. <laughs> the preacher said, why didn't you do that before you came? The man said, I didn't need one before I came. We want to get out quickly. Get the job done and move on. We all suffer from the hurry syndrome, don't we? You tell me, when you go to the grocery store and you pick up just a few items and you head for that express lane and somebody beats you to it, don't you stand there and count the number of items in their cart? You do that, right? And if it's 16, you know, or, or, or the grocery lines, you survey all the lines, which one's the quickest? I'm going to get in that one. So you get in the quickest one. You know, we all do that. But do you kind of keep a mental note of how the other lines are doing to see where you would have been? Did you really get out faster or not? You know, we, we want things to go quickly. Do you remember... Okay, when microwave ovens came out, we were all skeptical. This is voodoo. Ooh, how can you put paper and plastic in an oven and have it come out hot? And we were right, we were afraid. Waves, microwave waves coming out and cooking our insides while we're watching our food cook. We we're skeptical, but now it's an essential item. God forbid the microwave breaks. What would you do? How would you ever reheat food on the stove? It, we wouldn't know what to do. We want it now. We want it quick. Fast food is more popular than ever. Computer printers, oh my goodness. I remember when if the printer could print faster than I could type, that was amazing. And now, if it doesn't produce my 20-page document with high-resolution color photos in less than 30 seconds, I'm irritated. I want it now. Do you relate to that? Are you with me? We are in this age of get it done and get it done quick. And we are sicker than we think. We are sicker than we think. Do you think that all of our striving to be fast and to be more productive is making us better people? Is it making us more godly? Is it making us more spiritual? Is it helping us to draw near to what's really important in life? Yesterday we remembered Ron Harris. It's a time when everything stops for a moment. And we start thinking about the things that are really real. The things that really matter in life. And that's why Solomon said it's better to go to a, a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Because we understand suddenly what life is really about and what's important. We all suffer from this 
hurry syndrome, but I'm not sure it's making us better people. There's something corrosive that happens inside of our spirits when we get to moving so fast that we don't have time to stop and realize who God is and focus on what he's doing. There was a study at Stanford University many years ago. It was a group of preschoolers were set around a table and in front of each of them was set a marshmallow. And the instructions to the kids were this. You can, you can have that marshmallow, you can eat it now, or you can wait a few minutes and you can have two. And then the, the adult left the room. Well, most of the kids failed the test. Most of the kids grabbed that marshmallow and ate it down. That's, that's no big surprise. But what they did is they followed those kids all through their school careers, all the way to high school graduation. And here's what they found in that group of kids. The kids who waited for the second marshmallow, they did better in school. The ones who weren't, who didn't grab it right then, they were more confident kids as they were growing up. They handled stress better than the others. They were able to better resist peer pressure when they were able to stop and wait for something that was more valuable. Patience is a good thing. It's a thing that we, we want and yet nobody wants to pray for it. And you know why that is, don't you? We don't want to pray for patience because we know that the only way to practice patience is to be put into situations where we have to be patient. And we don't want that. And yet, we need to learn a valuable lesson. Secret to life. Get ready. You are not in control. We want to be in control. We want to wrestle that control right out of God's hands and take charge of things and make things happen and make things stop happening. We want to be in control, but in reality, we don't have control over all of our circumstances. We can be good choices or bad choices, yes. But you don't decide. So many things in life that are just foisted upon you that you didn't ask for. We need patience as we walk through this life because we're going to come up to those situations where we're just, our patience is running thin and guess who shows up? At those moments when we want things to happen quickly, guess who's sitting right on our doorstep? Satan shows up with a quick fix for you. You don't have to wait for this. Let me show you how to fix this right now. You've been praying. You've been waiting, longing for the intimacy in your relationship that you've always wanted. And Satan shows up with a quick fix. And you wake up in the bed of someone you barely know. There are quick fixes. Do you want it? but you can't afford it. But <laughs> you can pull out that credit card and go deeper and deeper into bondage. There's a quick fix. Maybe you need to wrestle with some personal demons in your life. Or you go out and buy a bottle or some more pills or another thrill to take your mind off. You see, there's always a quick fix. Your marriage is struggling. You could do the long, hard, slow work of repair, or you could quickly walk away and feel better for a moment. Satan offers us all kinds of quick fixes, and in this world of rush and hurry, we like quick fixes. Do this now. Promise me something better. Promise me something faster. Promise me I can get out of this today and I don't have to wait. And we are anxious to take that. And the thing is, God seems to specialize 
in the waiting game, doesn't he? God doesn't always give us everything we want right away, does he? But that's the mark of a good father. There is no good father who gives his children everything they want right when they want it. What happens to children who get everything they want when they want it? They grow up what? Absolutely, you know, they grow up spoiled brats, wanting everything and not valuing anything. Who was the teen, was it in Texas, who came up with this idea, of, uh, they, they coined the term affluenza? He had been given so much in his life that he no longer, he said, I don't know what's important. I can't know. You can't hold me responsible for knowing what's valuable because I've been given everything all my life. And I think the kid's probably right. He doesn't know what's true. He doesn't know what's good. He doesn't know what's valuable. God specializes in this waiting game, but it wears on us. We don't like it. But here's the thing we need to know about God in this waiting game. You will never struggle with something that God couldn't fix right now. You, anything in your life, God could fix it. Boom. He could heal somebody. He could make a, a new job. He could, do that. he could do it today, couldn't he? What can God not do? Nothing. Lie. He can't lie. God could do anything. So there's nothing you're going through that he can't fix that quick. But he doesn't. Why? Because God is more concerned about your character than he is about your comfort or your happiness. Can I say that again? God is more concerned about your character than he is about your comfort or your happiness. We t joke about character building experiences, don't we? We tell our kids, this is gonna build character. But isn't that what we want? We want our children, as parents, we want our children to grow up to be good people. And so, we tell them the realities of life. There are things you have to wait for. We can't just always have whatever we want. Sometimes the waiting is actually a blessing. And God seems to specialize in this waiting game because he knows, because he values the character that it will build. <clears throat> Down at the mall, there was a shop. It had a, had a sign in the window said, ears pierced while you wait. <laughs> I thought, okay. I want to see the other sign. <laughs> I want to see the other option. What, what other option is there? There are some things that can only happen while we wait. And character building is one of those things. Drop off your spirit here and come back and get it with character. No, we have to wait for it. We have to go through the process of growing. And when we do this, something that happens to us, we do grow. When we wait for things and we, we watch how the Lord works patiently, God builds character in us and we grow into something that's called maturity. We actually grow up. Have you ever known any children, any 40-year-old children? 50-year-old children never grew up, never developed maturity? This affluenza kid in Texas, I'm, I don't know if he'll ever grow up. But God wants us to grow. And he says, when you grow, this is in the first part of the book of James. He says, when you're counting all these various trials, know that the testing of your faith is going to produce endurance and endurance makes you mature and complete lacking nothing that sounds like the life I want the problem is it's a process of waiting being patient on the Lord but James shows us some pictures in this passage some examples of waiting the first one was the farmer 
He said, look how that farmer waits. Look how he patiently waits for the crop, the harvest that God has promised to him. But this picture of a farmer waiting is not a sedate, sit around on your behind sort of waiting. What does a farmer do when the crop, when it's not harvest time? He plows the field. This is called active waiting. He's plowing the field. He's fertilizing the, the rows. He's planting the seed. He's watering the crop. He's doing all these active things until the harvest comes. And then he reaps the harvest. There is this active time of waiting that God says, wait, like the farmer waits for his crop. He doesn't do it by sitting in the farmhouse watching TV shows. He gets out and does the work of plowing the field so the crop will produce. I start thinking, okay, what do we need to be doing while we wait? What do you need to be doing as you wait for God to build your character? He tells us a lot of things to do and sometimes we want the big things. We want, we, I want to be walking through the Red Sea. I want to be this guy. I want to be the one with Moses. Moses, you and me, buddy, through the Red Sea. I'm going to tell my grandkids about this. Oh man, what a story. That's what I want. But how many of those Israelites lived in Egypt just made bricks day after day after day. They were born into slavery. They died in slavery. And they made bricks their whole life. And they're going to tell their grandchildren, yeah, I remember when I made that brick. Boy, that was a good brick. <laughs> one of the hundreds of millions of bricks I made, but that one, that was a good brick. What, what kind of a story is that? We want it now. And yet, those Israelites who made bricks, they didn't know what God was doing. God asked them to be faithful during that time of waiting. God was building a nation that was going to do things they could never imagine. And they were a part of that building process. And God said, while you're waiting, be faithful. Love your neighbor. Take care of each other. Devote yourself to me and to purity. There are things that God wants us to be doing all the time while we wait. That's the picture of a farmer. He gives us the picture of the prophets. The prophets are people we read about, we look at what they did, we admire them. The Bible talks about the prophets in glowing terms. And yet, you know what happened to all the prophets? Yeah, they died. Do you know how they died? They were killed by their own people. The prophets, the ones who are most faithful to God, were often the ones who suffered the hardest trials in life. And we say, what good is faithfulness if it doesn't give me comfort and happiness? And James says, look at the prophets. You know what they were admired for? They were admired not because they got everything they wanted, not because they lived in big palaces, they were admired for the things they persevered through. Who are your greatest heroes? The people who sat back in the lap of luxury or the people who didn't quit when the things got hard? That's who we admire. The people who persevered, the people who kept going, the people who waited for the end, but they didn't sit back and wait. They were active in their waiting, but they're patient on God being obedient to him. We need to have prophets as our mentors. Because here's what the prophets were aware of. They were absolutely convinced that God is good. If they weren't convinced that God is good, they would not go through the things they went through. But they knew in the bottom of their hearts, God has a promise for me and it's going to be, say it with me, good. And if I don't believe that God's good, it's going to be hard for me to wait on him. But when I look through the Bible, I go back and I read all the story of God's dealings with his people. 
I don't know. Some people come out with a, with a funny idea that God's angry. And if you cross him, he's going to smudge you out. Or he's going to send disease and famine or something to you that, that God is this angry God. That is not the picture of God in the Bible. The picture of God in the Bible is what James tells us here. He is full of compassion and mercy. He loves you with all of his being. The prophets knew that. And they followed and they persevered and they waited on God while they were being obedient. James gives us a picture of Job. He says, you remember Job. You remember Job and how then the people's minds go, oh yeah, we know Job. He's the one that God looked at Satan, talked to Satan. He said, look at my servant Job. He's a good guy. And Satan said, yeah, he's a good guy because you give him everything he wants. Anybody would be good. You let me take away his stuff and he'll curse you to your face. And so God said, all right, you're on. Satan ripped everything away from him, killed all of his children in one day. Can you imagine? And Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And Satan said, yeah, fine, take his stuff away. You touch his body, you make him hurt, and he'll curse you. And so sure enough, Satan did it. Satan made him ache from every cell of his body. Emotional suffering, physical suffering. Job was not happy with it. Don't be mistaken. But he was persevering through it because he trusted in God's goodness. That's our mentor. The way James says it in this passage in verse 12, chapter 5, he said, look at what God finally did. It took a long time. But God finally rewarded Job. Job went through life with scars. But he also went through it, the promises revealed of what God was going to do. And it's God's mercy that's keeping us waiting today. It's God's kindness that hasn't destroyed this world already. It's God's gracious compassion that keeps us taking another breath today because he's got a purpose for us, because he's not willing to see anybody perish, because he wants everybody to come to him. God is being merciful with us at this moment. Did you know that there's an earthquake fault running right under this building? And if you live in Southern California, there's one right under your house. Did you know that? They come up with a new earthquake fault every now and then. I go, duh. We're in Southern California. But we haven't fallen off into the ocean yet. Why? Because God is being patient with us. Because he is merciful. It doesn't make waiting easy. But knowing that God is good helps us to wait through the times that are difficult. It helps us to deal with the pain of life. When we're patient, but while we're being patient, he says, be active, plant, plow, teach, love, pray, draw near to me, be my people, walk in faithfulness as you wait for what I'm going to reveal. God is at work right this moment. He is doing something great. We say our country is going to hell in a handbasket, whatever that means. <laughs> and it might be. We are the salt. We are the preserving agents. We are the ones that God has sent here to wait for his revealing. But while we wait, he's called us to be active, to be touching people, to be loving people, trusting that if we don't see the sky rip open tomorrow it's because God's being merciful and we need to continue waiting for the revealing of his promise we're going to sing a song that says the joy of the Lord is my strength here's where I find the strength to wait 
Here's where I find the strength to go on when I lose somebody I love, when the job falls through, when the health fails, when the eyes grow dim and I can't do the things I need to do or want to do. Here's how I might go on because the joy of the Lord is my strength. He is the one I depend on. He is the one I put my hope in, not in the things of this world, not in the quick get it done now routine that we get caught up in. It is knowing that he is good and he is faithful. And so we offer an invitation to you that if you've never put your trust in this good God, the one who's got great plans to say, I'm going to take you home to be with me because I haven't made you for this world. I've made you for something much grander than this. This is just a short-term assignment. I'm going to take you home. If you've never put your trust in that God, then we want to make a time available for you to come down and say, I want to put my trust in that God. You can be baptized into Jesus to put him on and live according to his power and his spirit and his wisdom. And we can help you do that today. If you need to be praying about waiting through all the different things of your life to doing the slow, tedious processes sometimes that it takes to be people of maturity and you need help with that, our elders are waiting in the back to say, let's sit down and pray about this. This is something that God wants too. Let's go to him. So if we can help you to give your life to Christ or to deepen your life in Christ, would you do that while we stand and sing this song?